So Renee, I, I don't know if you know this coming into the show, but this is, I've just realized that I have a, an annual tradition of having a massive gap in my episodes right at the most important time of year. I, I didn't realize it until just before I called you, but I looked at last November, October, and just as iPhones came out, there was a huge gap, and then I had you on. And apparently that's what I did this year too, because I just had a gap of a, a month, which doesn't <laughs> usually happen. And now you're back. So uh, I guess this is my horrible tradition. I feel you. We skipped two pot. The new show I started with Georgia, we skipped two episodes just because I was so busy reviewing things. Yeah, it's been it's been really hard to keep up. So, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. The last, last time I talked, I mean, to catch you up on uh, what's happened on this show was last time was just, I guess, before iPhones came out. So they were announced. Sebastian DeWitt came on. We talked about the cameras a little bit um, and yeah. what we could expect. But now we've both been testing them. You've put out a million review videos. And if anybody listening doesn't already follow Renee Ritchie on YouTube, no better time than now because you've been releasing like two videos a day. How many? (laughs) I don't even know. I'm so tired. It's amazing. (laughs) I'm so tired, Tyler. Yeah, there was just so much stuff. And I went went as best as I could beast mode. I mean, I don't know if I caught up to Justine, but I tried. No, you, you you did well, and I've been really glad to see all the the in depth coverage because um, it also happened to be busy time for the other parts of our work that we do. Because you know I've said this a million times, but we do YouTube and tech reviews and stuff. But we also have like a regular production company as well, so we're like always splitting our time and attention. And in general, I mean, I, this is something I'm, I'm just kind of wanting to tell everybody. Okay, so everything that was canceled earlier in the year is kicking us in the butt right now. And, and so actually even in interesting ways, like uh, anybody following me on Instagram, I appreciate your patience that all of a sudden I dropped a whole bunch of sponsored posts back to back, yeah. but it's because everything was canceled for like four months and some things are ongoing contracts, right? So it's like, oh, we have like a retainer for the year and now everything has a green light. And I, I think this is happening in terms of tech announcements too. Like this was the whole world. We had a few months off early in the year, so now we're playing catch up. Yeah, and it's been everything. It's, it's been like Apple and Samsung and Canon and Sony and just everybody. And, and, and yeah, it just keeps going. And I mean, if there's any theme I feel like for this episode, it is like all the next gens just hit all at once. Like there are some really substantial and important changes that have happened in, in many different ways all across the board. I mean, we'll, we'll yeah. focus on Apple today because I think that's the catching up we have to do is especially, you know, both some of our iPhone experience, the new yeah. M1 chips in the, in the new Macs. But there's little details of all these products around me as well that are, are just completely wild. And that's why that's why there's no conversations. I mean, even in cameras, if we wanted to just get into the rat hole of all the little cameras we've been excited about lately, I'm sure we could yeah. spend the whole episode talking about that. But where should we let's start with iPhones, because that's the big thing I missed talking about. And we've obviously we've had them for a while now. I haven't even done a video yet about the Max and the Mini, although I've been testing both of them. Yeah. Um, so I mean, wh- where's the best place to start just with iPhone 12 period? What's like the big thing that after a few weeks has really stuck with you? So I would, you know, I think like the, the biggest change is probably the design just in terms of how it feels when you're holding it. But I, I've just gone full bore on those cameras and that's been the most exciting thing for me personally. Yeah, especially, it's funny because a lot of the changes weren't where I expected them. I thought I was gonna see a huge change from the lens. Um, yeah. and then also the, the sensor on the max, those were the two, that's what I had my eye on and where I'm like, I know this is going to have a huge improvement. What I ended up loving the most is actually the software improvements moving to all the cameras. That was the thing that will have the biggest quality of life impact for me. And I think that, that, that might be hard to convince people of almost it's like, well, it, it got a better camera, but you're more excited about this artificial software enhancements, but there's so many situations where all of a sudden, um, selfies in medium low light, which is very common. I mean, if you're taking a selfie indoors, your lighting's usually kind of low. It's a world of difference. It's a huge improvement, especially because those cameras were, you know, not as good as the front facing cameras before. Wait, which one's front and back? Uh, The the primary (laughs) cameras before. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I've super been enjoying those and, uh, and as well as on the ultra wide too, all of a sudden the ultra wide is usable in a lot of places that I used to kind of write it off. I'm like, man, you know, this, this can't quite take a photo in this dark room. And now I'm never afraid to just zoom in and out to any lens. And I just don't worry about it because it is going to turn out to at least a usable place for the internet. 
Yeah, the, the, the biggest compliment slash, so I don't know the way to term it, but the, the most amazing thing about the current software, the computational photography on the iPhone 12s is that it is so good, it caused a lot of people to dis discount the optical and sensor improvements on the 12 Pro Max. And it was, I, I think the, the crux of it came down to when there were several reviewers who said they didn't see any difference, like Peter McKinnon and Marquez Brownlee and just several others. And then there were reviewers who said they saw a profound difference, like Matthew Panzerino and uh, who was one of the other ones? Well, um, Sebastian, which I have some things to get into with him, his review. Yeah, after. Sebastian. Yeah. And there was also one, at least one or two more. Oh, Austin Mann. And it turned out, like after a, some back and forth on Twitter, that the people who were shooting static objects like computers, Lamborghinis, like anything <laughs> not moving, thought it was identical to the to the regular 12 Pro. But anyone trying to shoot toddlers or pets or anything in motion saw the difference immediately. And that was not what I would have anticipated the reaction being or the differentiator being. Yeah, my Lamborghini tests all turned out uh, to be exactly the same. Uh, no, no. I, so yeah, in my, I, so I haven't shot my review yet, actually. So I wouldn't say that I've done the real tests. I've just kind of had life day to day tests in it so far. And, you know, I, I want to do something a bit more controlled for when I eventually do a real video about it. But the, the things I've been seeing, so a, a good example was, um, the other night we were just taking, uh, so Anya, my wife is using the Max right now, and I'm using the Pro, and that kind of gives us a point of comparison. So she's taking a photo of the cat in the dark room, and I'm like, great, I'm going to get in on this and take the same photo. And then looking at those side by side, that's where I started really seeing a significant difference. It wasn't quite dark enough to kick into night mode. And I think if it had been, it might have equalized a little bit of the difference. But at just at, that's where you really see this big difference is right at the edge of like night mode, pre night mode. Um, it was that was a world of difference. Hers looks like a real camera, and, and mine doesn't. Um, you know, because the ISO is absolutely maxed on the Pro. Like it, it, everything is cranked up as far as it can just before night mode kicks in. And once night mode kicks in, it starts doing all sorts of intelligent noise reduction and sharpening. And so then the image kind of gets over this bump and suddenly looks a little better because of processing. But uh, before that point, the the Max is able to really pull ahead because it still has extra room in its ISO. It has a bigger range of total ISO. So there's extra noise above what it needs to do. So it's not peaking. Whereas you're, you're starting to get that, that noise clip in the, in the regular Pro. And that's where I really started to see the difference. So exactly what you're saying, like with toddlers running around, it's that thing of like, well, in, in static object, it's gonna be sharp both ways, especially if it's lit well, there won't be an important difference. But yeah, once something is moving through frame, the difference of, you know, I, I don't actually know what the shutter speed difference will be, but let's say it's like a hundredth of a second instead of a 50th, which I, it's probably kind of close to that. That's the difference between sharp and blurry. So yeah, because it's not just the object that's moving, you're moving to acquire it. And when it's a still <laughs> yeah. object, you're stationary, the object is stationary. That's a very easy relationship for the software to handle. But this when you're moving and it's moving, it's it's really, like you said, relying on that sensor difference, relying on the pixel size difference, relying on, on everything that that brings to bear. And it sounds like a very small window, like a very small use case, but I think that's how we get improvement now. It's not this like, oh, suddenly we put in, we put in a new kind of glass and it's twice as good. It's them making small wins every year, just small improvements every year. And you know what, in the professional camera world, those wins are something we kind of get used to and we're willing to pay for. You know, if I think about the, the differences between cameras like, if you're familiar with the, the Canon range, there's the 6D in the old olden days. There's the 5D and the 60. 60 is low, lower end, 5D is right above it. Um, and the six, they are both full frames. They have the same sensor, but it's a slightly cheaper lower end sensor in the 60. And the difference of price was something like $1,000. It was significant. And if you just look at the specs of these two sensors, they seem like they should be the same, but you're willing to pay for that professional, you know, lower noise, a little more dynamic range. Everything's just, you know, 15% better, but that's a different, that's a real difference in a lot of situations. And I think that this is the first time that the, the Pro Max really is pro in that way. And the really interesting example that Sebastian came across, and I, I got to dive deeper into exactly what was happening and try to replicate some of his tests, but it looks like the image signal processor is doing 
is basically treating both phones almost the same. So it's applying the same amount of noise reduction to both the, uh, I'm gonna get names wrong here, but Pro and the Pro Max. Um, and the effect of that is that we're, we're getting a little, the Pro Max is turning out a little bit smudgier than it could, because once you shoot in RAW, all of a sudden you see that that's, that uh, sensor is actually doing way more, and Apple maybe just hasn't written a re-optimized image signal processor just for the Max. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I think so. I think that's exactly right. Because when he was, he's, you know, Sebastian famously makes Halide, you know, with uh, Ben and Rebecca, and it's a terrific app. And when when he was pulling the information right off the sensor, it's exactly as you described. It's a really clean sort of image. But it's possible that Apple just hasn't tweaked Smart HDR 3, which, by the way, is a huge improvement. Like, Smart HDR 1 was sort of, like, we're kind of smooth and red on everything. Then, Pro, then Smart HDR 2 was getting much better. But Pro HDR 3 really seems like they're doing everything, like, from semantic rendering to texture preservation to all these things. Like, they just dialed it up to 10. But it doesn't seem like it's taking full advantage of the differences in quality that the... I have to get the names right now too. The 12 Pro Max can deliver. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is is surprising. And um, you know, I shouldn't. Even though, okay, so the the camera on the Pro Max is amazing. I should give Apple a bit of a knock here. I mean, it, it isn't ideal that you need to understand this Pro stuff to get all the image quality out of it. Like, ideally, everybody would just see those results immediately. And I think Apple would have had some better reviews if the JPEG or the sorry the the Heath files, the 8 bit normal everybody uses the default camera app images were as visibly better as I think they could be. Apple would have had the stronger Peter McKinnon review, the the stronger reviews from people that don't want to go a little deeper into the technical, like what's going on here, which I don't blame people for not wanting to do. You shouldn't have to, like this is a consumer camera. Um, But yeah, so uh, actually it was Sebastian's comment about it to me. I don't know if this was in his article, but he was just saying like, this is the the first time that they really mean it, that like pro means pro because you have to spend a little extra time understanding it to be able to get the optimal quality out of it. And understanding a raw workflow isn't dead simple. Like you, you got to learn a few things before you can really jump in there and actually get something better. So Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely true. And even when you talk about like they, they've got a different telephoto uh, camera system on here too. It's not, I think it's F2.2 instead of 2.0. And it's 65 millimeter equivalent instead of 54 millimeter equivalent. And that's that's a very different framing. And the compression is different, even though it doesn't sound like a lot, like it's, you know, it's, it's 11 millimeters difference, but the compression, like the, the, the way it flattens images is different. And I find that a lot of fun, but for some people it's just, whoa, it's too close. I'm cutting everything off now. Yeah, that was another example I saw in the, the cat photos we were taking with Anya the other night was, um, that's the little bit of slowness, which I, th- I think it's 2.5, no, oh, 2.5 times, but yeah, is it 2.2 instead of 2.0? So it's slightly slower, and it is enough to notice, and what happened was the telephoto on the Pro Max was kicking into night mode, and I didn't have night mode appearing on the Pro. So it, 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 that's some interesting behavior stuff when they're side by side that all of a sudden they're shooting different types of photos because the specs are different enough that the signal processor treats it differently and that like really quite different images came out. This episode is brought to you by Lexar. If you picked up a brand new camera this year, you might also need some brand new media for it because they have some crazy new features that are only enabled if you have a fast enough memory card. So for example, the CF Express Type B cards that Lexar offers are so fast that the R5 can shoot 8K raw and record directly to that card. You can also do 120 frames per second, 4K in 10 bit. All this stuff is insane. And I didn't think we'd be able to do it on consumer, you know, prosumer level cameras anytime soon. So yeah, I'm very glad that Lexar has been able to enable this. Uh, They also have great fast 2.0 cards, which we use in the C200 all the time and tons of SD cards. We just have a stack of Lexar cards that we shoot on all the time and having reliable media is super important. You've gotta be able to trust it that it's not gonna flake out on you because you know this is where our photos are. One thing I've liked lately is when we're shooting on the R5, those photos are huge, 45 megapixels or whatever. Each one is kind of enormous and downloading a memory card can take a while, especially an SD card because SD has a limit. It can only go so fast. CF Express Type B, 
it has well it has no limits uh, maybe it has a limit i don't know what the limit is though because it's ridiculously fast so unloading 128 gigabytes off that card just takes a couple of minutes because of lexar's fast card readers too all of it it's it's amazing the future has arrived so thanks to lexar for sponsoring this episode and go check them out there's a link in the description below if you want to know more so yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, also a lot of reviewers go out and shoot things in really ideal situations because they want it to look good, which I do that too. That's very common. So you go shoot the most beautiful, if you shoot the mountains in the day, they are always beautiful. But um, I think the reality of what so many people are shooting on a day-to-day -day basis is in much more adverse situations. And it looks like there will be a real difference with the Mac. So yeah, if you want the, if you want the best pot, if the, your main camera is a phone and you want all your photos to be as good as they can. I think it is worth it to get the Pro Max. Just be aware it may not be as simple as you imagined ahead of time. Last year, I took the Pixel 4, then brand new Pixel 4, and the iPhone 11 Pro out on Halloween, you know, before the world ended and we could actually do Halloween. <laughs> when there was a um, Halloween, yeah. And I was just testing night mode. And one of the things that struck me was because Apple has really focused on instant shutter, even though night mode was doing all of that image stacking and doing all of those different brackets to get the night mode image, it was still cap doing the initial capture immediately where the Pixel 4 was doing the sum over brackets. And so my friend Georgia, her brother came over and put his arm around her as I was taking the picture and in the iPhone one, he's not in it because <laughs> it, it started capturing immediately when I pressed the button. Yeah, right. But in the Pixel version, I took him at the exact same time He's in the photo, and now Apple is starting to do so much work that it still tries to instant shutter, but you see now that it's actually processing more over time, not quite the length the pixel takes. But I find it interesting, too, that Apple's willing to lean more into the computational part just to get those better results now. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's just been so worth it. There's always this amazing effect when you take night mode photos where something in it is actually very well lit. So uh, a lot of the scene is dark, but you know, uh, the best example I had was really early in my 11. Um, we were at camera camp. So we were sitting, we we're on a lake and there's a starry sky in the back. That's very dark. The lake in front is very dark, but there was a house and all the lights were on in the house. And as the exposure comes up, you see it lock the house in part way through. This is like a 10 second exposure. And all of a sudden the house locked in frame. And as you hold the phone there, you just start seeing the, sc the stars gradually appear and the lake gradually appear. And what's incredible that you would never get with a real camera is that I'm hand holding it. My hand is, can't be perfectly still. That's just not how hands work. They kind of have a little bit of movement, but it understands where the house and the sky were and it's mapping them into place and putting the stars where they will be sharp in the sky, which is not what would happen with a, a professional camera. And uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of old news because we've already had that for a year, but it still blows me away. And I think we don't appreciate it enough. It's doing a lot more than a, a standard long exposure would. Well, what was interesting for me is I did some shots with the shelves behind me and I just put an iPhone on it with the screen on the iPhone on, and I was shooting it with both a Canon and an iPhone. And the Canon, it looks like that iPhone screen is on a pretty, like almost black background. There's almost not, like you can see some shadow shapes and back illuminated shapes, but that's it. Where the iPhone is exposing everything on the shelf and not blowing out the background and not blowing out the screen. And because it's doing all of that image stacking, it's able to take all of those exposures in the time it takes me to take the picture and then just composite all of them into that final frame to do something my, like my, the Canon looks fantastic. It looks like I'd expect Canon video to look, but the iPhone one looks like I'm, it's, it's like everything is perfectly lit. So I feel like my whole, my whole review, I was very positive. Um, and there are a few problems. And I feel like maybe, so, so now, now is kind of what I'll, I'll bring them back up. I'll try, I'll try to bring them up in my next review of the, the Max and the Mini as well. But there are some things that kind of bugged me um, that I didn't get around to. And so first example, um, what's really beautiful and impressive is the 10-bit HDR. And, and maybe this isn't a, a, even a fault against Apple exactly, but um, I think a lot of people will be a little bit frustrated when they realize that it can be a real challenge to, to actually end up working with it outside of your own phone. Um, it's not a, like, it's not as uh, straightforward of a win as it would seem if you just pick up the phone, you start shooting a video and you see the difference. And you're like, wow, like this is real. Like 10 bit, like HDR uh, can look very different. And then you 
airdrop it to your friend and all of a sudden it doesn't look good. Or the, right away, I posted some Instagram stories before Instagram had um, rewritten the, you know, kind of updated to accommodate the, the 10-bit, the Dolby Vision. And it looked crazy, like br- completely broken, not even a little bit broken. It was the images where you couldn't look at it. Um, that's been updated. Hopefully every other app is being updated as quickly as possible. But uh, I think there, it's, it's good for people like us that understand it to just give a bit of a disclaimer that if you pick up a new phone that shoots in 10-bit HDR, decide if you want to shoot in it or not. And don't feel like you have to. And I've actually been shooting more in SDR because I end up editing these into other SDR projects. And that workflow is way easier to, if you're starting with an SDR file than if you're converting it. So anyway, I mean, mean, I had that issue as well. Like there's another problem, I think, on top of that is that Apple was trying to be smart. And what they would do is they record both the HDR and the SDR tone map at the same time, and they preserve them both. And then it detects the kind of device you're airdropping it to, and it'll send the HDR or the SDR tone map as it decides appropriate, but you have no control over it. Like I'd love if the little details button would let you choose HDR or SDR, but it doesn't. And a lot of Apple's non-HDR devices can display HDR with things like temporal dithering. And so like the latest MacBooks, the latest iPads, all of those things will just do their best. And they look they look really good because they're still getting all that information. But then you try to drop it into an editing program like Final Cut, and it'll say you need HDR tools. And yes, I can grade these. I did it for a few, but for my review, there just wasn't enough time. So I had to I had to airdrop them to an iPhone, an iPad 7, which doesn't have that capability, and then airdrop them from the iPad 7 back to my Mac just to get the SDR tone mapped versions. That's a better way to do it took, than I did. But well, I, Michael Fisher said he like he he rendered everything out of iMovie afterwards, which took him hours. Well, so what I did was the same thing I'd done when I was shooting with the Sony in HLG mode, which is a you know, a form of Rec 2020. Um, it is SDR footage. So they're shooting in HDR to get more dynamic range in SDR in standard. And in Final Cut Pro, you can basically tell Final Cut, okay, interpret this into the uh, standard dynamic range video f- project as if it's standard, and then it kind of squishes those highlights down and it looks more or less normal. That's what I did in, in, in my videos anyway. But uh, I mean, all of this is too much for people to have to know. So again, I, I, this isn't something that's Apple's fault. They did amazing, an amazing job of being able to implement this at all, that a phone can capture this and, and live, uh, I was going to say grade it, that's not the word, but you know, live process the yeah. images to look natural and, and organic. And record and, the metadata like in real time, which yeah. is amazing. But they don't give you a, like also you don't know that you're in HDR mode. So if you, if you don't remember and you pick up your phone and start recording, there's no HDR indicator the way there used to be for photographs. And there still is for things like live photos. And there's no little toggle. Like you can tell that now that you're in whatever, 4K 60 and then hit it to go to 4K 24. But it doesn't say HDR and there's nothing to hit to turn off HDR, which makes it not intuitive, cumbersome and error prone at the same time. Yeah, and I can tell there was confusion even in some of the, like some top reviewers that under do understand this stuff, but at first were interchanging the HDR format, like the Dolby Vision HDR, and and they were using that language in a confused way with the HDR tone mapping. Um, so if any if anybody listening hasn't figured that out yet, which even the first time I heard them say, "Oh, Dolby Vision HDR," I did I got this wrong too. HDR is both a form of delivery, or yeah, of delivery, which is what Dolby Vision is, and capture, which is what smart HDR is. And when you're doing it in capture, you are squeezing more latitude, more brights and darks, into, uh, let's say, a standard of like 100 nits of a certain amount of brightness. You're squeezing it into like, that's the max brightness we have, which is what was on CRT televisions 30, 40 years ago. And and you're just making that dynamic range fit inside of it and look natural and good. Uh, That is very useful. And that's a lot of what we perceive as as good image quality. And that's, you know, most movies that you watch on your TV, you've been watching for the last few years with a lot of dynamic range squished. Then there's the delivery format where you'll have a brighter screen that's more than 100 nits, maybe 500 or 1,000 or whatever. And that those, the brightest parts appear they are they don't just appear brighter they are actually brighter it needs to be explained a million different ways by everybody uh, before i think any it's really going to sink in because it's the same 
three letters representing some different concepts. And you even saw like Jonathan Morrison, who is no like newcomer to HDR, is still like, here's the video, here's the download file for it, here's the video, <laughs> yeah. the Vimeo version. Yeah, it's 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 hard to to share and to show off and to demonstrate. Um, it's real. It's just uh, you know, it's almost a little bit like VR, like. You gotta you gotta put the goggles on to get it. Same thing. Like if you want experience, it means a bad time to recommend anybody go into an Apple store because a lot of people can't even. But unfortunately, getting one in your hands it can be the only way that you really understand that difference um, because things that were mastered down to SDR uh, don't show it at all. So yeah, because you see the display go from 600 nits to 1200 nits right in front of you as the video starts, and then it's like the it's like the world a layer of dullness disappears from the world. Exactly. Something, another, okay, so a negative that, um, you know, I, I hate to nitpick, but it's still there from last year. So I got to point it out is that there are also still a lot of image ghosting effects when you're shooting in low light and there's a light source pointed right at the camera. This really came out in the 11. Like I think it was, I didn't, I don't remember it from the 10. I'm sure there was some of it. It got bad in the 11 and it's still bad right now. And that it was really visible in my review, but I don't think I mentioned that like, hey, this is actually still a problem. And I'm sure Apple knows it's a problem. I'm sure their engineers made some, decided to make this trade off. They're like, look, these, we can, you know, increase the sharpness and the low light performance this much, but the trade off is a bit of ghosting. So yeah, I, I wish it was gone, but. And if people aren't familiar, that's when you, you see the image, like someone is panning over traffic at night and you see just a bunch of lights, almost like UFOs. Uh, mirroring the, tra the traffic, the, the lights on the cars as you pan by. Yeah, and it happens both in photos and in video. It's especially noticeable in video because you can see the movement sort of tracking along with it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do hope that gets resolved. It's visible and I Photoshop it out all the time and uh, I'm sure somebody's on it. But, <laughs> I'll, but I'll mention it until it goes away because it's, um, honestly, that's probably the biggest complaint I have. And, and cause even with the 11, like I was just so satisfied with it going into the 12. I was like, I don't even know what's on my wish list, but, um, you know, it, it still turned out pretty well. Any, do we have anything else about the 12? That's like really struck you. Uh, MagSafe's been, uh, functional, but, um, hasn't like changed my life. I like it. And I think it's going to get uh, integrated into some of my camera accessories soon. I hope. Yeah. I mean, I hate to be that person, but it's, it still strikes me as beyond odd that, you know, there's no power brick, famously, there's no power brick in the box, but there's also no power brick in the MagSafe boxes. And if, if, if you're weaning me off the power brick in the box, you got to give me the power brick in the MagSafe accessories. Yeah, I totally agree. That is kind of weird. And um, you need, I mean, right now my MagSafe is plugged into my computer. Like I've kind of been keeping it plugged into my iMac and it doesn't charge very fast like that. I don't know how many watts are coming out, but it's very slow and it can go up to 7.5 watts. I've heard you need the Apple charger, but I don't know which one because it would have to be a USB-A high watt charger. I, I'm sure if I looked on the website, I'd find it in two seconds, but it's not obvious. I wish it was more obvious. The 20 watt charger will give you 15 watts of wireless charge, which is you know good for Apple, but you have to have that specific charger, which you have to buy something new to get it. Right. Is that what it's up to? It, was I just getting that wrong? It goes up to... 15 instead 7 of... 7.5, if, if, you, if you have one of the previous chargers, it'll go up to 7.5. If you have the new charger or, or because it, it varies based on the voltage of the charger as well, then it'll give it'll kick you into 15 watts or 12 watts on the mini because the mini's battery is just a small. There's also a firmware update that, uh, uh, well, I don't understand the details enough to, to help anybody, but that uh, kicked me in the butt a little bit with certain Qi chargers. Um, so I had recently talked about the Nomad Base Station Pro, which I loved. And then all of a sudden I had updated my... Uh, iOS and it stopped charging reliably. Like I'd take it off a few hours later. I'm like, oh, it's not charged. Do you know what happened there? Do you know the details? Uh, they fixed it. So I'm guessing it was just sort of some software based incompatibility or something they had to handle with the power management system. But it, which side was it on? Was it an iOS update that caused the problem or was it like, what? Where did it, where did this problem even come from? I believe it was just in the power management negotiation um, for those devices, because if it had been anything worse, I don't think they would have been able to fix it in, in software. Hopefully it's fixed because it drove me crazy for a few days. But the um, only other thing that was super notable to me was how many of our tech friends just fell absolutely head over heels in love with the tiny iPhone 12 mini. Oh yeah. I, okay. Th th right away. As soon as I picked it up, I'm like, if I didn't do f photo, like visual production as a job, I'd probably do the mini. I really, really liked it too. Um, I, I just can't, it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. I need as much battery as I can. And 
a bigger screen does come in handy sometimes. But the day I got it, I hadn't quite, I wasn't really using it yet. It was just sort of set up and I'd put it in the same pocket as my wallet. And then I just forgot it was in my pocket all day. And I'm like, wait, where did the mini go? And I realized I'm like, oh, it's just attached to my wallet here. Like they're stuck together. And I didn't know I had an extra phone in my pocket for no reason. I've not felt it when I had nothing else. I've put it in my pocket and then wondered where I put it because I just, like, I don't want to totally Casey listed and call Casey listed and call it iPhone adorable, but it really is close to that. No, it's, it's such a great product. And I think I actually, I know based on YouTube comments every year, people don't understand how much different models are actually the same. I think they, because there's a visual difference, they, they expect more performance difference than there is. They think it's going to be slower. They especially think the camera is going to be worse. It's the same camera and it's the same processor and it's the same performance other than like a smidge smaller battery. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, it's ridiculous. I ran I a bunch of that. iMovie exports to test it. it. It goes every bit as fast as the Max. Like, it doesn't throttle down. It doesn't do anything. It, like, the battery goes way faster. And I know some people are like, why can't the Mini have the same battery life as the Max and physics? But it, it does go toe to toe in speed. It's ridiculous. Well, so how about those? How about those Max? Um, I, if, my way of testing them right now. So uh, let me see. When when I called you, I was at forty. 2% battery, and uh, we're doing this call on uh, the M1 13-inch MacBook Pro for me, and I forgot my charger at home, and I decided, screw it, I'm going to see if I can get through this whole episode, and now I'm down to 38% um, running a, a FaceTime call, and uh, you know, I do not think that this is going to die by the time we're done talking, so uh, just one of the many exciting things about it, but um, I don't know, how, how have you felt about it so far? I think there's like some huge wins and some huge caveats. And I think like there's a lot of people on the side who just can't believe that M1 Max could be this fast. And there's other people who are like, they're this fast, therefore they, they must replace my Mac Pro today. And I think both of those are extreme views that aren't backed up by any like real information. But in the middle, the, the, the truth for me is that these are Apple's ultra low end, ultra low power chipsets that are running circles around Intel and almost everything but the latest AMD chips by, with almost no battery draw and with a responsiveness that is like an iPad. And when I say that, people are like, eh. But like you get so used to how fast everything is on the iPad. You tap it, you're there, you're done. And the first time I was using just everything, I tried everything on the, on the MacBook Air even before I even tried the MacBook Pro. And it was just instant. The fan, there was never any fan noise. There was never more than a couple bounces. There were never any beach balls. There were never any drop frames in Final Cut Pro. And like I wasn't taxing it, but just the ability, if, if you are a MacBook Air type customer, if, you, if you're not trying to delude yourself and saying you can replace your Mac Pro with this two port, you know, eight gigabytes or 16 gigabytes machine, the experience is so, like the quality of life is so much better. It's astounding. Yeah, I, I definitely think that most of the negative things I've seen said, because uh, I asked this on Twitter, I was like, hey, what's the worst thing about these new computers that you've seen in any reviews or that you've experienced yourself? Almost all the answers were confusions about where this sits in the product lineup or, um, you know, the the reasonable details, which is the the webcam is still crappy. Um, not, uh, well, I was gonna say not enough ports, but that's a confusion is, I mean, okay, you can, com you can complain about it, but you're going to get the ports and something else. Like that's just not what this machine is. I think there was this problem where like people who are on tech Twitter and tech YouTube forgot that Apple made low end machines. Like they only ever bought the high end machines because these exactly replace the Intel machines. Like there were these... The Air replaces the two port Air, the two port, Mac, two port MacBook Pro replaces the two port MacBook Pro. And they just didn't realize those machines existed. Yeah, I, I really do think that is what happened. It was a confusion. But I, I, I want to make sure that I get on rec record myself at some point saying that I think that this is the beginning of Apple really taking over consumer PCs. Um, and when I've told that to other tech people, uh, you know, it's, I was right after the announcement, I was talking to Stephen Hackett and I, I said that and he was like, I don't know, that might, might be a bit of a stretch. And a few other people have told me like, ah, you're, you're too excited about it. But like, I really do think that there is, there's no chance that when average people that, you know, usually drift towards a PC, cause it's like, well, I want to save a few bucks. Um, and maybe it's a little performant in certain, more performant in certain ways. 
there's not going to be any good reasons not to buy the Mac anymore, unless you actually prefer Windows or have Windows-specific tasks. In terms of hardware, you're going to be able to have a ch cheaper Mac that performs better and has all of these incredible quality of life things that we're not going to see Intel or AMD catch up to anytime soon. And it's going to be really hard for uh, normal people to justify a PC when there is this Mac option out there. And this is just the beginning of it. There will be, there needs to be the whole lineup before this can really come true. But I'm, I'm certain, I'm sure of it within two or three years, unless Intel can pull some kind of miracle, um, I, I, Apple's gonna just jump ahead in the same way that they did with the iPhone and with iPads, I think. I think the key there to what you said is in the consumer space because these are increasingly computing appliances and that's gonna rankle like the, all the people that we know who want like hobbyist computing machines that they can change their own RAM and change, swap out the hard drive. So anybody who comes from that traditional hobbyist computer background is gonna absolutely hate this. And at first, people may not even consider a Mac just because, you know, previously they didn't, they never heard that great things about them. But I think if as awareness builds, I think some people will still think they're too expensive, but not realizing how long they hold value for, like how many years this industrial design lasts and you get updates for. And, you know, it's, it's not expensive when your PC breaks after two years and this lasts for six years. But even then, I expect Apple will do what they did with the iPad. And when we get an M3 or an M4, there'll be like a MacBook Air SE that's even cheaper than this. And I think that's when Apple's going to start to make, like do a lot of damage to the consumer PC space. Yeah, and I think the floor has been raised in such a meaningful way that you're going to be able to buy an Air for things that you wouldn't before. I mean, it, it, so far in my tests, which have just been real-world tests, I, I haven't run any benchmarks. Everybody already beat me to the benchmarks. Everybody else had already done that by the time I got mine. Um, so, And I haven't done a video yet. But uh, So I was just, you know, like, okay, let's... Do, we did a day of studio photography where we were tethering into it in Capture One and uh, edited a few batches of photos ed on it and uh, did some video editing and just, you know, did some big production stuff where the video is 4K raw and the photos are uh, 45 megapixel raw and some of them were, we were um, doing like compositing and stuff. So it turned into almost 100 megapixels and I've only got eight gigs of RAM in the one that I'm using right now and it was fine. The, the only time, the only hiccup I ran into was once I had that uh, 85 megapixel photo uh, I was doing certain like um, AI stuff. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, what is it called? Smart fill in, in Photoshop. Yeah, um, sort of those things that are a bit more like processor intensive. And then I'd have to wait a minute, like, but I don't, I'm not really convinced my, more, my professional Intel versions would have been any faster. Everything else was completely fine. So I think what this means is that like, even though Apple kept all the prices, m most of the prices exactly the same, What's going to happen is you're going to be allowed to buy the cheaper one and still get your job done. Um, and we're going to have to redefine what a, a low-end machine even means. If you can edit multi-track 4K on the cheapest Mac you can buy, what's low-end? What's low now? <laughs> you know, it's, it's weird. There were a couple of caveats that I ran into, um, specifically with the Mac Mini, but they would apply to the MacBook Air too because it's essentially the same system. And that is, you know, the, the memory is fine because they're using unified memory and they're doing memory compression and the swap speeds are so fast that unless you know to look, you, you have no idea when you're actually swapping to disk and when you're still using live memory. And that I think is a huge win. But just the size of the store for the, the kind of work that I do, the size of the storage only goes to two terabytes, which sounds like a lot. But if you have like the 256, like I have the 256 uh, gigabyte Mac mini, which means I have to use external storage. And then that speed benefit goes away. And only having two ports on any of these machines and they're on the same side of the machine is like me complaining about, you know, I don't say first computer user problems, but Sometimes I need to plug in more than that thing. And when you start putting in hubs, then you're you're splitting the like the. You're, and I know you shouldn't, but then like the sort of write speeds go down, and it starts to become painful. So I think like it, depending, and also just for me again, the 10 bit Canon codec, the uh, what is it XF AVC, is running in Rosetta, and it's fine. Like it runs fine, but I don't think the raw plugin has been updated yet. You just can't do it, which w I guess I just haven't tried to do that yet because I transcode my raw into ProRes. 
if you have certain types of workloads, I think you literally, like you, you really can save money and downsize. But if you are someone who's going to hit those limits, like you're dealing with really big files, really arduous, you know, workflows, max out the memory, max out the storage, you'll probably be okay if you can survive on only a couple ports. But I still think it'd be like, you're going to, you're going to be so happy when the M1X versions of the Mac Pro and iMac and stuff start coming out. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I, if you need that stuff, a lot of people are deciding, well, what I'm going to do is complain about it on Twitter. But what you should do is just not buy a computer right now. Like, it, it, you know, if you, if you don't need it in the next 24 hours, which, okay, if you need it today, okay, just go buy the 16 inch because you need it. So go ahead. Um, if you don't have that kind of time pressure, just wait because it's coming and it's going to be as good as you think. I bet. Uh, and that's not what these are meant to be anyway. Like these are meant to be lower end. And it's just, it's such a bonus surprise that I can do all that professional work on it. Yeah. Well, there's, a, there's another symptom that I think, you know, in, in I don't want to say in facts, but you know, it's, it's, it's characteristic of tech Twitter and tech YouTube. And we saw this when the, t- the first 12 inch MacBook with the single port came out. And you know, previously we all felt like every Apple product was for us, you know, like everything, there were so few products they made that we should just be able to buy all of them. They should all be for us. And when that came out, I just remember so many of my friends like posting these pictures of them holding these handfuls of dongles. And I'm just like, this, this really isn't for you. Can I please take your hand and lead you over to the MacBook Pro shelf in the Apple store? Because you'll be so much happier. Yeah, totally. I, I think this, a lot of the, the complaining will kind of subside as, as these come out because like I say, I, I just, it, it's going to be a hard comparison. And the PC side, I mean, I'm still interested in what's happening over there. Like there's crazy cool stuff. What, what the the GPU race right now is amazing. Like what both what NVIDIA did earlier and then the fact that the Radeon seemed to be, you know, giving them a bit of a run for their money. Like it's, it's, it's neat and it's never been more fun to build a, a gaming PC or a 3D rendering PC or just like a big beefy workstation. But like we keep saying, that consumer space where that's not the kind of work you're doing, um, I think will be much harder to, to have a reason to go on the, to the window side. And what makes me super excited too is that, you know, for as much grief as Apple got for not putting a lot of numbers on their slides, they put that 10 watt line and that lets you sort of, you know, divide by zero, carry the one to figure out where they're going to go as power increases. And you're like in the iPhone devices and the iPad, I think they've been like at five watts, six watts, 10 watts maybe. With these Macs, I think they're like 10 to 15 watts. The, the NVIDIA Ampere cards and the, uh, and the AMD uh, big Navi cards are like 200 to 300 watts. And they have fans on them like the helicarrier from the Avengers. And the, the amount of thermal budget that Apple has to grow these, these chipsets right now is just astonishing. So I'm super eager to see where they can go when they start going like massively multi-core or start pumping up the, the wattage on some of these, these uh, SOCs. Yeah, no, I, I honestly, I just can't even imagine it right now. I, I was expecting great things. It turned out a little better than I expected. Um, I'm, I'm really, really happy with them. There's a few other just things in the, in the tech world. Oh, well. There's a hundred million things in the tech world going on right now. Um, I don't know how many of them you've had any time to look at since you've been uh, knee deep in uh, Mac and iPhone reviews lately, but I've just been playing with a few other things I wanted to kind of throw out there because there's a lot. Um, one is that I got uh, an Oculus Quest 2 and I wasn't, I wasn't really pursuing VR very much. I was like, oh, it's there. It seems to be getting a little more real. Um, and I did a video about, about it, but it, um, it's pretty, it's like arrived basically the full wireless uh, way of interacting with it that like you buy it like a video game console and it's, you know, 300 bucks us 400 bucks Canadian. And you just put it on and you're like, I'm just playing games right away. I don't need to figure, I don't need to make sure I have compatibility over here. I don't need to worry about what cables running around. The experience was so refined and I don't know, it, again, it's, it's like another one of those next gen things. It's like, this felt like next gen VR. You know, I, I had the PlayStation VR before, which worked, but you had to plug in. So, and the box behind your TV was as big as the VR headset, like not the same as this experience. So, that's one that's been really awesome. I don't know if you've played with any VR lately, but. I have the original Oculus and I was all set to get the Oculus 2. And then Facebook decided they were going to require Facebook logins, which and I stopped using Facebook. And I was like, I'll do it anyway, because it's not that, you know, Apple requires an iCloud login and Google requires a Google login. But then they started banning accounts if you weren't posting to Facebook because they assumed that you were a bot. 
if you weren't, and I'm like this kind of, co like I'm, I'm waiting for them to sort out and maybe they're growing pains, you know, or maybe they really do want to force you to use Facebook. I don't know, but I figured I'd wait until all of that sort of pain of transition was over and then look at it and see whether I thought it was morally acceptable to use it or not. Yeah, it's not the kind of question you want to have with a console. Like, I don't worry about that if I'm buying a PlayStation or an Xbox. So definitely something to strike against it that, I don't know. I mean, it seemed like Facebook understood this earlier when they weren't forcing the accounts. And I think they said they never would. And now they are. So, mm, yeah, not great. More exciting is uh, I've got a PS5 on the way. I don't have it yet. But I'm, I don't know. I, I kind of... I. When I started doing a tech channel, I sort of went down the path of not doing a lot about video games. And video games are really exciting right now, and I don't have much time to play them, but I'm like, man, there's just so much going on. I just I want to talk about it. So I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to get some videos out about the PS5 because it's looking so awesome. What I've seen everybody else posting, um, huge things being uh, because of, you know, w which is what PlayStation told us to expect. SSD speeds mean that there's no waiting time, and no waiting time means you experience games differently. Yeah, I love that. There's There are certain people who still think like if you're not gaming on a PC with one of those giant NVIDIA or AMD cards, you're not gaming. But the AMD SOCs in these machines are really, really capable and they just are such an instant experience. I didn't get them because I was so busy, I didn't bother ordering them. I usually end up getting all the consoles at some point. Uh, and that my, just just watching Miles Morales and just watching Cyberpunk and looking at those sorts of experiences it's not like uncanny, like there was this big fear that they would try to make stuff look too much like real life and it would just massively fail. It's all highly stylized and richly textured and the writing has gotten so good and the atmospherics and the sound and even the PlayStation controllers, like I was watching a video today, I forget who it was, but they're like, you pull the trigger, if your gun's drowned, the trigger doesn't pull anymore. Yeah, I really, really want to try this controller. Everybody has said that it is like the defining thing. So I'll, you know, I'll get back to you guys once I've tried it too. Um, are you going to pick one up? Like, have you, have you decided one or the other? Are you going to pick them all up? What are you going to do next I'll year? I'll probably start with the PlayStation just because of Miles Morales. Um, and I end up I end up getting them both anyway, and then my godkids end up stealing them. So that's just a cycle of life for me. Yeah, yeah. No, I, that's definitely the right policy. And then like um, I got you know, the PlayStation last time because of VR Batman, like the VR Batman, even though it wasn't the best VR, just being able to look down and seeing yourself in the Batman suit sold that console to me. Yeah, no, uh, the, the exclusives are the thing that sucks me into PlayStation for sure. So yes, like you're saying, uh, Miles Morales, Spider-Man, and uh, I'm, Ratchet and Clank, which I haven't played before at all, but just looking at them, like, that looks like next gen. Like, that looks like the a futuristic platformer that is doing things we couldn't do right now. So, and you um, know they'll be God of War at some point. Yeah, for sure. Apparently coming a little faster than we thought, uh, they the idea being that like with Ragnarok, they've got a little more of the base from the, the last version um, that they're going to be able to, it took five years to develop the last version of God of War and this time they're saying maybe three years. So yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of keep like stumbling over myself lately because I'm like, there's just too much goodness. And even the cameras that we're not talking about right now, uh, every, every brand released their dream camera this year and it's just this competition of like okay they're all perfect which perfect camera do you want with like one tiny compromise um do you do you plan to pick up any more cameras in the near future you've got you've got you've already got a few dream cameras that, that going right now so yeah well i'm still using the c the c500 mark ii and then every time i, I open a gerald undone review of a sony camera i just i i, I just like bike down to because to, he's going to convince me i could have gotten almost as good a result for like one third the money um which, which always scares me. But uh, last time I was on, we were talking about the R5 versus the C70. And I because they're both still out of stock, I still haven't had to make a decision yet. But I'm, I'm eyeing both of them. And, uh, and then, of course, Gerald just posted that, that short Twitter thing saying how much he liked it, the C70. So not, none of, And then Jonathan Morrison and a couple other people are like, no, you have to go all in on Sony. Sony's just, they've arrived. You know, they've got the mid, they've got the low, low tier cinema camera now. They got the A the A seven S three. It's 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 the best and worst time to be a camera lover. I mean, the, the good thing is that you can. I feel like you can go all in to either brand. To, well, I mean, either there's other there's more than Canon and Sony out there, but either of those two, you can just go all in, and you probably will be happy. Um, I, do, I don't think you'll be really missing out. The C seventy looks like it's going to be pretty solid. I have since last time we talked, or last time recorded anyway, um, spent some real time with the R five, like shot quite a bit with it. 
And I've started to feel like it's not, so it's not a replacement for something, for a cinema camera. Like it just, it just isn't. It's still shooting on a mirrorless, um, a very good mirrorless, but the C log, which is the, you know, the image format or the, the gamut, you know, the color, the color profile, it, it just really does have less dynamic range. You can see it. You can see that there's less there and a little less flexibility in terms of grading. I wish it was flatter. I wish it already had C log three, which they say is coming. And then I wish C log two is coming, which they don't even say that it is, but that's what it would take to make this really competitive with the a seven S three. Um, because when I am trying to match it to my C 200 right now, it doesn't look as good as the raw, like it, it, you can get it to the point where on the web, people probably aren't noticing the difference, but I see the difference. I can really, yeah. And it's much faster to get the raw looking good. The, the R5 footage, it's like, you have to have nailed it and gotten it right. And then it couldn't look perfect, but you can't mess with it too much afterwards. Um, and the, the flexibility of those, I, I don't even know if it's the raw or the 12 bit or the C log two, like whatever it is, I have way more flexibility coming out of the C 200. Um, and I think that seeing what the C70 does will kind of prove what's going on there. If the C70 can have the flexibility that I want, um, I don't know, well, that'd be great. <laughs> I have something good to say about the R5 though. I don't want to sound like it's all bad. What I've been loving about it, like really, really appreciating is because the image stabilization is so strong um, and, and kind of reliable, like it looks good. It looks smooth. I've been doing a ton of just handheld gimbal type work um, and my lenses aren't stabilized. I don't even have RF lenses really. And I just am, you know, kind of rocking back and forth and doing those gentle movements and not putting it on a gimbal and it's usable. So especially in terms of B-roll for YouTube, if you're just shooting products and you can shoot in slow motion, so, you know, 60, or especially if you do it at 120 frames per second and you just do like a slow push in or pull back or left, right, you can do slider gimbal shots just handheld in a few minutes really easily because it looks stable enough, especially in slow motion. So that's been a little bit of a workflow hack that has made the R5 kind of, you know, earn, earn its keep, um, which I didn't buy it, so it hasn't earned anything. I'm just borrowing it. But, um, but that's exactly what I want because I've been doing that with an EOS R and I have to do so much stabilization and final cut afterwards to make it usable. Yeah, which isn't great. I mean, you see that stabilization sometimes, right? Like you get that jello effect and you're like, oh, I got to turn it down a bit. Um, and yeah, th there is none of that with the R5 unless you're on an ultra wide. Um, and actually that's one more thing I have to mention speaking of ultra wide. So I've been testing the uh, Laowa 12 millimeter RF mount cine lens, if, if you followed all that. And uh, it is so cool. Like you, even if you didn't get the cine one or the RF, like they come in all the different mounts and stuff. But their 12 millimeter, it's just like, they call it zero distortion and it feels like it, like it is totally straight on the edges. You don't see like straight lines curving. You do see, and this is something I think people get confused with ultra wides. If you put your hand, if you move something close to the lens, you'll see, you'll see it warp, right? You'll see distortion. And that is actually just like the physical proximity to the lens. It's, your hand is bigger because it is closer. And that's not the same as the lens distorting it. Um, the place to look for distortion is like straight lines in, in a room or something like that. And those hold on and it's crazy sharp. And yeah, anyway, I was boring this lens and I feel like I got to buy it because it turned out great. So yeah, I mean, if you want me to try to convince you to buy anything else, I, I'm, I'm here for you all day long because uh, I'm always happy to push camera gear on people. Yeah, no, I feel like I, I feel like I get both better and poorer every time I'm on the show. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, I'm so glad that you, that you are and I'm going to be watching your videos to get more and more hyped about all of the Macs and the iPhones that I need and, and how behind I am on making videos about them. You've been putting me to shame, uh, which good job for that, Renee. It's great. I just watched your Christmas video, man. That Twitter was on point. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, pri priorities. Uh, yeah, that was a fun one to do. Always, always love gift guides. So, but uh, thanks again for coming on, Renee. And um, yeah, we'll talk again soon. Yeah, anytime. I love it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.